Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Anna Kate. If you are new here, welcome. Please like and subscribe and share this broadcast. Today we have a great show. We're going to talk about the most important document after the Bible. It's the Constitution. It's the supreme law of the land. And we're going to talk about it with a lawyer and also a former prosecutor, Chris Ann Hall, who was fired 11 years ago this May for teaching American history and the Constitution by her boss, who she didn't know was left wing, from the state of Florida attorneys. She's going to talk about that with us. But before we get Chris Ann on, I want to give some quick love to the sponsor of this video, Nova Gold. Are you frustrated with this new administration like so many of us are, where we're seeing gas prices going up, maybe your retirement fund is dwindling, you're losing money, and you're looking for a new approach? Well, Noble Gold is a great place to start. If you're looking for an IRA or a 401k, precious metals is the way to go. Renewables need solar panels, electric circuits, and lots of other gizmos that use, you guessed it, Silver, with a projected $2 trillion investment, there's never been a better time to profit from the future with your silver IRA. Pick out a qualifying IRA this month and Noble Gold will gift you a solid gold 22 karat, one tenth ounce American Eagle bullion coin. Find out more at noblegoldinvestments.com. Again, that's noblegoldinvestments.com. So I'm here with Chris Ann. Chris Ann, you have such an interesting, crazy testimony. I mean, you <laughs> were let go 11 years ago this May mm -hmm. because you were teaching American history and the Constitution. You were let mm -hmm. go apparently by your boss who you didn't realize was a radical leftist. Tell us what happened. How is this happening in America, being fired for teaching First Amendment and the Constitution? Well, what makes it even crazier is I was an employee of the state of Florida and an attorney. So I was an attorney for the state of Florida who on my own time in the evenings and the weekends was traveling and teaching about the constitution of the United States and about American history. Uh, we have a, we had at the time, 11 years ago, a Supreme Court, a Florida Supreme Court justice by the name of Fred Lewis, who even created a whole program across the state called Justice Teaching that had set up a system where lawyers and judges could volunteer their time to go into middle schools and high schools and teach on the First Amendment. So I was a part of, uh, of the uh, Justice Teaching program. I was teaching in uh, professional groups, civic groups. I was on talk radio. You know, this is 2009, 2010. And it was just crazy because I had practiced First Amendment law with a nonprofit law firm. I was, I was a prosecutor uh, for seven years. And unbeknownst to me, when I went back to being a prosecutor after my short term at the nonprofit law firm, the boss that I had, the new boss was a coworker of mine. And I said, Hey, look, I want to come back to the state attorney's office. And do you need another attorney? He's like, Oh yeah, Chris, and we'd love to have you back. That would be fantastic. So he hires me back. And in my small rural community at the time, people started learning about how I knew the constitution, constitutional law, and so the school board of the local school district asked me to come and teach them how to have invocation before the school board meetings without getting sued by the ACLU or the, um, you know, people who don't like religious liberty in America. I went to the middle school, taught First Amendment. I was teaching to grassroots groups. And it was after I did an interview on the local talk radio show about how the Constitution uh, establishes that healthcare, the Affordable Health Care Act, is an unconstitutional act, that the federal government doesn't have any delegated authority to be involved, much less dictating our health care. And it was after that interview on the local radio that I got a series of emails from my boss. Now, I'm a state employee. I'm an attorney. He's an attorney. He sends me an email that says, I have to cease and desist all my association with right-wing fringe groups, as he defines them, and that I was, I was committing an ethics violation 
because I was teaching that the Constitution demands limited government. And because I worked for the government, he said that's an ethical violation. And so I'm like, first, I'm like shocked because he's an attorney. I'm an attorney. And I'm thinking, you know, and I had practiced First Amendment law. So I knew what he was telling me was in direct violation of my rights. And so I was shocked. I was like, how, how number one, can this attorney put this in writing? Must let much less, you know, make these demands of me. Now, the complicated thing was my husband and I just planted a new church. And so I was the only income in the family. And so we had a decision to make because my boss simply said, if you don't stop teaching these people, and not just simply teaching, he said, I couldn't associate with them. And if I don't stop teaching the Constitution the way I was teaching it, you know, the way the people who wrote it wanted it to be, that I would have to quit my job. That means walking away from the only salary my family had, the only income we had. Well, we prayed about it and we prayed about it fervently. And I can tell you that uh, I was, I had fear. I was afraid. Uh, I didn't know where, how, how are we going to feed the family? If we stand up for what we believe in, if we stand up for, for what is right, you know, what are we going to do? How are we going to pay the mortgage? How are we going to feed our families? And my husband came to me and said, you have been teaching people for about four months now that the day is going to come when we are going to have to make the decisions that our founders made. We are going to have to make the sacrifices that our founders made to ensure that we would have liberty. He said, how hypocritical would it be if we said, you know, four months of teaching, we meant you, not us. And he also said, look, we are the ones that believe that God, that liberty is a gift from God and that God is our provider and that he will always take care of us, never leave us nor forsake us. He said, what a testimony would that be if we said God was insufficient for our needs? And so we made the decision at that time to contact my boss. And I told him, I said, look, you didn't give me these rights and I'm not going to trade them for your paycheck. I'm not going to stop teaching and I'm going to associate on my own time, on my own dime with whomever I please. And he responded an email and said, I don't care what you think this is about or what you, what the first amendment says. Um, you have an ultimatum. You will work for me. You will carry my badge or you will teach. That's your choice. And I said, well, I'm not going to stop teaching. He says, you have to quit. I said, I'm not quitting either. You're going to have to fire me. So he fired me. And we went from a very comfortable salary in a small rural community to nothing at all overnight. And can I tell you, that 11 years later, I don't regret any of it. Can I also tell you that stepping out by faith like that, we have seen the glory and magnitude of God like we would have never seen if we had kept ourselves addicted to the paycheck provision. Mm. Can I tell you a story? Okay, so. Absolutely. When I got fired, the small community that we lived in, when they got wind of it, they started protesting my boss's office. I mean, we're talking about, we're talking about a community where the county has not even 60,000 people, right? And, 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 and by the way, I want to say, this is the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. This is not just a little tiny firm, which would, right. be, would still be bad. This is the state mm -hmm. of Florida's attorneys. Yep. Wow. Yep. I was an employee of the state. My boss was an elected official to office. He was elected by the people of our community. And uh, so I was fired by an elected official working for the state of Florida. So they started protesting and it, it really made a disruption in our community that hit the news. So where we lived was just about an hour from Jacksonville, Florida, which is a very big community. We were about an hour and a half from our state capital, Tallahassee, um, not far from, from Valdosta, Georgia. I mean, we were very close, very central area. 
And the Jacksonville Fox News picked up on it. And I think even ABC Jacksonville or CBS Jacksonville picked up on it. They came out with cameras and filmed it. And I got a little bit of national coverage. I was on Neil Cavuto for like 15 seconds. And we started getting letters in the mail and people were sending us money to help us, you know, like five bucks here, 20 bucks there. And it was coming from all over. One day we got a letter in the mail because one of the news channels had run our story and they saw uh, our son was, was four years old at the time. And they saw us, you know, our four-year-old son and the family all together. And the mom wrote the letter and said, you know, we sat down and we watched your story on the news as a family. And we want to thank you for being an example of living by faith and standing for the things that you believe in. And we were so impressed by that, the whole family, that we wanted to help you. So the kids, the kids, she says the kids emptied out all their piggy banks. We went through the couch cushions and the, you know, the car, and we found all the, the loose change and stuff that we had in the house. And we're going to send, we are sending you a check now. And the check was, was for like $143.37. And my husband and I being grateful because I was rolling quarters to buy a gallon of milk at this point. And uh, we, we looked at the check being very grateful, though we saw it kind of chuckled and we thought, who writes a check for $143.37, right? Rounded up or rounded down, we're never going to know the difference. Yeah. yeah. We had no idea why anybody would be motivated to write a check like that until the next week when we got the electric bill for $143.37, the exact amount wow. to the penny. And my husband started thinking about that. He says, you realize that the Lord put it on these people's heart mm. to write a check for us before the electric company even knew what the bill was, wow. before we had even used the electricity that would be on the bill. The Lord did that. And, you know, that has happened to us over 11 years. Now, God is always providing to us, you know, opening windows of abundance, of providing for us in abundance, above and beyond what we need, encouraging us. But every once in a while, he just drops in a little message to the penny. Yeah. To so let us know that we have not been forgotten, that he is still with us, and that he is our provider and because we stood for him, he stands for us. So Amen. I tell that story just to encourage people because we haven't seen the hardest times in America yet. We have not. And we, as believers, more than anybody else, we're going to have to make this stand because what we've seen in the last year has been a direct attack on the religious liberty of the people an intentional attack on the religious liberty of the people. That's right. yeah. We are going to have to make a stand and we have to know if not by our own faith, but by example of those who have lived work, lived and worked through their faith, that God is here for us and he is ready, willing and waiting mm. to be bigger than life for you. That's, that's right. And he is such a great God. He's our provider. He was your provision during this entire process. Mm -hmm. And, and talking about taking a stand, our pastor, Rodney Howard Brown, Pastor Rodney Howard Brown in Florida, um, is taking a stand, a stand as well against with all the restrictions. He's had church every single night for 300, and I think it's 12 nights now. Um, That's but actually I just, 26. Oh, wow. 326? Mm -hmm. Wow, praise the Lord. Oh, that's right. It was 320 a few days ago. Mm -hmm. um, amen. So I, I, I just wonder how many people would do what you did when given the option to take a paycheck and shut up and have a job and be able to support your family. I just wonder how many people would say, you know what? No, I'm going to step out in faith. God is my provider. I am not going to sell myself out and my views and my liberty, frankly, to be able to talk about the greatest document in history after the Bible and just step out and say, no, 
and you actually didn't quit. You you forced him to fire you because you said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm just, this is my right. I'm going to keep going and I'm going to keep teaching. You're not going to tell me not to teach the Constitution of the United States of America. Now, I also wonder, another question, Chris, Chris, Chris Ann, I wonder how many people actually have opened this and read the Constitution in its entirety? I really wonder, like I actually read it a few years ago and it's such an amazing document. It really is short, but it's so full of just the most intricate information. And I actually want you to break it down in terms of what are some key points in here that we might have looked over or some people may not have read. And for the ones that have read the constitution, tell us some key points of our constitution that some of us may not be aware of. Well, I want to encourage people in the beginning because we've had an education system now for generations that has gone out of their way to teach us that the constitution is complicated, that you can't possibly know what it means, that you must be a lawyer, you must be a scholar to understand it. Uh, that is a lie. Our constitution was written with brilliant simplicity on purpose. So the average person walking the streets in 1789 would know exactly how their constitution is written, could read it and understand it completely, and more importantly, know the role and duty of the individual in maintaining and restraining their government into the confined delegated powers of the constitution. And so don't be intimidated. It's not the constitution that's complicated. It's how we have allowed our, our governments to circumvent the Constitution that have created complicated government. And so if our governments were operating constitutionally, we 95% we, of the federal government that we have would not exist at the federal level. It would exist at the state level where we have the most control. Now, there's, there's a pop quiz that I like to give. Um, I've been now on the road. So 11 years ago when we stepped out, we just started teaching. We're like, okay, if, if this was what, we're gonna get what I'm going to get fired for, then we're going to embrace this as a ministry. So for 11 years, we've been traveling the country teaching American history and the Constitution. For seven of those years, we averaged 260 meetings in over 22 states every single year. We were literally spending four days a month at home. Wow. And everywhere for 11 years, I have asked this question. So I don't want anybody to, you know, you don't have to answer out loud, but it's this general test that I give people so people understand where they are. And you don't want to, I don't want you to look at your pocket constitution for the answer, not Google it or anything. I want you to come up with as much of the answer as you can without looking at any resources at all. So here's the question. The Bill of Rights, we have courses at libertyfirstuniversity.com that teach all about the Bill of Rights and what they mean. But the Bill of Rights has a First Amendment. Within that First Amendment enshrined are five inherent individual liberties to yourself and not out loud name all five liberties of the first amendment now i have been traveling for 11 years since i've been asking this question for 11 years i've seen national polls you know like um newspapers do polls the media does polls we have organized polls who have asked that question and these polls, these national polls have solidified what I have found in my own personal experience, that less than 2% of the people in America can name all five liberties of the First Amendment. And the reason that I ask this question is this. If you don't know what your rights are, how do you know they're not already gone? If you cannot define your rights, how are you going to defend them? And maybe even more importantly than that, because the people we elect to office, even all the way down to the mosquito guy here in Florida, takes an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. How do we elect people that can keep that promise if we don't even know ourselves the conditions of that promise to vet them properly?
I mean, how do we know that if they're going to support and defend the Constitution of the United States, they have to know they have a duty above the law, right? Their duty is not to enforce the law. Their duty is to enforce the Constitution, which is to secure those liberties that are enshrined within the First Amendment. And so since I've already given you time to look at it, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of press, the right to peaceably assemble, and the right to petition the government for a redress of grievances. And I wonder how many of the people that we've elected to office, if you went up and asked them to do that, how many of them could do that? And they're the ones that took the oath to it, right? Mm, yeah. You and I were out to lunch with our pastor the other day, and you mentioned at the table that it's actually, I mean, this is the truth, this is in the Constitution, but just to really break it down for people who are who may, who may not be aware of this, when we have our local representatives go out and work in the federal government. They're actually not, they're not being promoted. Everybody wants to be president. They think they're having a promotion, but they actually have very much a demotion. So I want you to explain that. Well, it all boils down to how the constitution in the federal government was created. This is one of the things that we have been miseducated on through disinformation for generations. You know, we have, we have, uh, people, governors who want to run for president. Well, you actually have a higher position as a governor of a state than you do the president of the United States. Part of the reason that we have that misunderstanding is because we've expanded the power of the president through the way we think well beyond what the constitution creates. The president of the United States actually by constitutional delegation has very well, practically no autonomous power at all. The only thing, constitutionally speaking, that the president of the United States can do alone is to issue pardons and reprieves for federal crimes and to give a State of the Union address, treaties, appointments, everything else, uh, moving troops, all have to be done with the consent of Congress and most of the time with the consent of the Senate alone in order to do that. So just a little basic constitutional lesson. The states, whether we, you know, just to remind us, the states existed as independent sovereign governments 13 years before this constitution we have today existed. Independent, they were created as independent sovereign governments on July 2nd, 1776. Even before the Articles of Confederation, they were governments first. The states created the Constitution as a contractual agreement between the states, and the federal government was created by the Constitution. So the federal government is the product of the Constitution. The states are the creators of the Constitution, which makes the states the creators of the federal government, which is why state office is higher than federal office, because number one, states have more authority constitutionally to create laws, more broad lawmaking authority than the federal government does constitutionally, and the states are the creators of the federal government. So as a governor of a state, you have so much more authority and so much more autonomy than the president of the United States to trade that would be a violation of, of you know, a, a demotion rather. And it happens the same way. We have senators in the U.S. government that want to run for president. A senator is actually a higher office than the president of the United States because a senator hold so much more power and control, constitutionally speaking, than the president of the United States. So it ought to be a more, a more cherished position to be a governor or a U.S. senator than to be a president of the United States. Wow. And these politicians just want to have that name, that title. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like they're throwing this wonderful document out the window. Yeah. Because it's, the government has gotten so big. So are you trying to say that Joe Biden really wasn't supposed to pass 100 plus executive orders. Is that what you're trying to say, Chris Ann? That's like, well, that's you know, <laughs> Joe Biden can actually write as many executive orders as he wants. The problem is what 
is the content of those executive orders because executive orders are actually allowed from a constitutional perspective. But the purpose of an executive order is for the president, who is the chief of the executive branch, to issue directives to the agencies and agents of the executive branch. So it's like the CEO issuing a memorandum to the board of directors or the employees. When a, a, an executive order reaches outside the executive branch and starts controlling the states and controlling the people, now you have a completely unauthorized authority and a completely unconstitutional power being exercised by the president of the United States. By the way, James Madison called it the most violent attack on the constitutions was a separation of powers violation. And when we use presidential executive orders to issue directives that carry a force of law on the people, you are now violating separation of powers because lawmaking was reserved to the legislative branch. I just wonder, you know, with your boss who was a left winger, is it that he's misreading the Constitution? I mean, how can he possibly fire you for freedom of speech, number one, but also mm -hmm. teaching the Constitution the way that it is written? What is your take on that? Well, you know, it's a number of things, actually. Um, I can show you specifically where in 1833, our colleges and our future law schools stopped teaching the Constitution properly. So we created an educational doctrine that he is operating on that is contrary to the Constitution. So in 1833, our textbooks turned aside an actual handbook written by our founders on how the Constitution is to be applied and how federal government is supposed to work and traded it in 1833 for a new treatise, a new textbook on operating in the government and to the constitution written by a Supreme Court justice named Joseph Story. And that textbook in 1833 was driven by the same ideology that drives him now. I mean, the Marxists started taking over our education system in the mid 1800s and this transformation in 1833 was done to teach our lawyers and our judges to unconstitutionally apply the Constitution so that government, federal government, could increase its power and eliminate the control of the people. So what we have to recognize first is that our law schools don't teach the Constitution properly and haven't for many decades. Now, you might find a handful of schools that of law schools that actually are, are, are more properly leaning, but there's always that leaven of error that I call federal and, uh, federal and judicial supremacy. This idea that the supremacy clause of the Constitution, which you can look at in right there, it's Article 6, Clause 2 of the Constitution. We call it the supremacy clause. But for since 1833, we've been teaching that the supremacy clause establishes that federal government, federal laws, and federal regulations are superior to state law and state constitution. The Supremacy Clause, Article 6, Clause 2, actually says the exact opposite. And so we've been teaching a, a converse of the most fundamental principle of our constitution since 1833. Uh, you get people like my former boss who have no clue they simply don't have any clue. But then he's also driven by that, that Maoist Marxist ideology that we have to silence our enemy and we have to set aside anything that we disagree with and we have to isolate and eliminate contrary thought. So you combine over 178 years of misinformation, miseducation and disinformation on the Constitution with a radical Maoist Marxist ideology. And that's how you get somebody like me teaching the Constitution the way it's supposed to be taught 11 years ago, mind you, getting fired. I mean, mm -hmm. 
we have to realize that people have been isolated and eliminated in their positions and in their voice for over a decade now. Yeah. I mean, you see people in social media now, the big Twitter thing, the big Facebook, the big YouTube thing, people thinking this is all brand new. It's not brand new. I was fired 11 years ago. And there have been people like me taking a stand over the years. It just hasn't reached, you know, the, the sort of mainstream media level of attention. You know, you mentioned something. You mentioned the Supreme Court justices. What is your take on the Supreme Court justices today? And a few of them, our president put in. What, what, what is your take on, on, on them and some of the picks that President Trump has put in there? As a whole, our Supreme Court hasn't operated under, you know, through the authority, the limited authority of the Constitution for a very long time. Uh, part of that has to do with the uh, nomination hearings that we have. And if you watch a judicial nomination hearing, you'll notice, you know, if you if you've been through our courses at libertyfirstuniversity.com, if you've been through our constitution training, you notice that the uh, hearings by the Senate Judiciary Committee on nominations of Supreme Court justices are political, not constitutional. So the criteria by which our Senate chooses a Supreme Court justice is already wrong. They're all asked questions about their political stand. Now, they don't say politically, are you a Democrat or a Republican? But all their questions are based on politicized opinions and politicized decisions. And are you going to find against this? Are you going to follow this? You know, and they're all based on politics. Uh, Supreme Court justices do not have lifetime appointments. I know people say that all the time, but it's not true. It's not in the Constitution. Supreme Court justices have a very specific term limit, and it's called good behavior. And Supreme Court justices, by the way the court was created by the Constitution through our founders, is that if a judge exhibits bad judicial behavior, they're supposed to be impeached and removed from office. Now, some people might say, well, doesn't that sort of beg the question of what is bad behavior? Well, perhaps. But the honest answer to that is the people who designed the office of the Supreme Court specifically defined what that meant. And ironically, the most egregious form of bad behavior is an activist judge. The very criteria by which we choose judges is the primary criteria for which they are to be removed from office. And so we start off in the wrong direction anyway. The best Supreme Court justice that we have had in decades is Neil Gorsuch. Uh, now, Neil Gorsuch isn't 100% constitutional, but he is the closest I have seen in my study of history of Supreme Court justices in a very, very long time. He is better than the well-known Justice Scalia. So that would be my, my statement on the appointments of justices, that we need eight more like Neil Gorsuch. And you have a really interesting perspective where we really could take this country back. Mm -hmm via the Constitution doing what? It's a six-year plan. Tell us about it. Yes. So um, it's, it's, it is actually a twofold thing. So there are immediate, right now, tomorrow solutions to eliminating overreaching government. But there's also a long-term solution that we work for while we operate in the immediate solution. So the immediate solution is uh, what we call peaceful noncompliance. It is the understanding that our founders established that when the government executes laws and authorities that are not authorized specifically by the Constitution, those laws and authorities are null and void. Um, uh, Alexander Hamilton said, no uh, law contrary to the Constitution can be valid. James Wilson said, they are no law at all. And so the authority of peaceful noncompliance is the people in the state simply saying, look, we didn't authorize you to do that, so we're not going to comply with it and we're not going to allow you to enforce it here. 
So it really liberates the people in the states from these, as you mentioned before, these crazy executive orders. Our states and local governments have no obligation, no legal obligation whatsoever to comply with these executive orders and by the constitutions of the state and the directives of the Declaration of Independence, they have a duty to refuse to comply. So that's the immediate solution, peaceful noncompliance. Now, I just want to drop in there. I didn't say civil disobedience because there's a difference. When we refuse to comply with laws that lack constitutional legal authority, we are not being disobedient. What we're actually doing is enforcing the constitution we call the supreme law of the land when the government is refusing to follow it. So it's actually the government being disobedient. The six year plan is a way to maintain a constitution, to restore a constitutionally operating government and to maintain it over time. So in the first four years of my six year plan, we must exclusively be involved in controlling state and local government. That means all your political resources, all your political uh, efforts and time and money are dumped into state and local elections. So you build a constitutionally vetted county commission. You build a constitutionally consistent city council, school board, and more importantly than those other three entities, you establish, elect, and maintain a constitutional sheriff. A sheriff who understands that as an elected representative of the people, the primary duty of the sheriff is not law enforcement. The primary duty of the sheriff is preservation of rights. Sheriffs do not take oaths to enforce the law. Sheriff take, sheriffs take oaths to enforce the Constitution of the United States and of their state, which makes them have a duty and a requirement to refuse to enforce any law, state, local, or federal, that violates the constitutions. Unfortunately, we don't teach that. Now, we travel around the country and teach that to the sheriffs and the police academies all over the country, but in general, we're not teaching that. So you'll get sheriffs who say, well, you know, it's not my job to decide what's constitutional or not. That's the job of the judiciary. That sheriff is miseducated and doesn't understand the job of the sheriff. If you take an oath to support and defend something, you absolutely have the authority and the duty to determine whether it's being attacked. And that means you have to be qualified to make those decisions. And most Americans don't realize, Anna, that the sheriff is the most powerful defender of your rights in your county. Your sheriff outranks the county commissioners, the city council, the mayor, the governor. Your sheriff outranks the federal government with the authority to tell the federal government those laws will not be executed in my county. That's the authority of the sheriff. And if you have a constitutional sheriff, Anna, your pastor's not going to be arrested for staying open. Your sheriff is going to be standing there saying, no, no one's going to at attack this church because I'm its defender. So you spend four years building that nucleus. Then you take the people from county and city government, you send them to your state capital. They become your state legislators. They become your your state house, your state senate, your attorney general at the state level. They become your governor at the state level. Then when you've secured a constitutional local government and a constitutional state, the federal government will have to fall into lockstep because a constitutional state knows that the federal government doesn't have any authority within the boundaries of their state that isn't specifically authorized by the Constitution, not through interpretation, not through forced construction of language, but actual enumeration, the state has the authority and the duty to say, you can do that here because it follows the Constitution. You cannot do that here because it doesn't follow. Once you have that, now you can work on getting the federal government under control.
Yes, because once they understand their constitutional duties, absolutely, and the power that they actually have in this state, that is when you can tell the federal government, hold on a second, you are overstepping your boundaries. Right. And until that happens, the government's going to keep getting bigger and yep. bigger and bigger and yep. bigger. And you're right. A lot of it is miseducation. A lot of it, they're not being taught. A lot of it as well, they're people are just complacent, just want to get a paycheck. They don't really care about the constitution. They say they might say they do, but they just want to do their job and go home. Yeah. And, and the fact that we have been just so to the side and not right. get involved and not yes. fighting for this country, we're seeing a fight now. And if we don't step up now, right. it is totally over in this country because they want to shred this thing through a shredder. <laughs> it's, it's demonic. Yep. It, well, it's not over in America. As a matter of fact, we have a long way to go before it's over. But if we don't start standing up and doing our duty to our future generations, what we will condemn on them is a fight that they will have to take to the battlefield that we could have taken in the public realm, a peaceful battle with an easier victory or condemn our future generations to die for what we were supposed to give them as the gift of liberty. Samuel Adams, this has been my, my driving founder's quote for 11 years. And I think that I, I chose it because it so accurately describes the, the main problem in America today. Samuel Adams wrote, no people will tamely surrender their liberties nor be easily subdued when knowledge is diffused and virtue is preserved. He said, on the contrary, when the people become universally ignorant and debauched in their manners, they will sink underneath their own weight without the aid of foreign invaders. Our ignorance has allowed us to become pacified in prosperity, lazy in luxury, complacent and compliant in our comfort. And we have allowed our liberties to be abused and destroyed by those in power because of our ignorance as to the constitution, the proper role of government and the duty and the power of the people to maintain it. Thank you for teaching us the constitution and things that I wasn't even aware of. So I know that you teach in Pastor Rodney's School of Government at the River Church. Um, you do that Monday to Friday and then afterwards you're, you also teach online, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we uh, have River School of Government courses. My husband and I are both professors there. And we've de designed a curriculum based on Pastor Rodney's vision, which is absolutely transformational on what pe we should be teaching people who want to be involved in government, who want to be activated in government, who want to change how and, and restore America to its foundational principles, raising up a new leadership in America. And we've sort of adopted a biblical scripture of Acts 17, 6. And if you go read Acts 17, you see why we've chosen that. And the scripture is those who have come to turn the world upside down. So our current operation of government is so contrary to its original foundation that it is opposite and so what we're doing is coming along and through this amazing curriculum, taking the opposite creation of our, of our government that is established today and turning it upside down to restore it to its original foundation and its original focus. And so that is a three-year program at the River School of Government. And it is, it is an education that you will not find anywhere else. Biblical training, constitution training, no one is teaching this. I don't care what university you comes to mind. Nobody is doing it like this. And we have the plan for success. So anybody out there, and I don't, we have students who are in their 50s and 60s, as well as students who are, you know, typical college undergrad age level 19, 20, 21. Anybody who really wants to know how the government's supposed to work and the successful way they themselves can be a part of the solution, then the River School of Government is where you need to go. We only take enrollment in the fall. Uh, River University has River Bible Institute, River School of Worship, 
uh, River Espanol. So they have a whole Spanish ver uh, segment of, of education. But uh, they take enrollment in the fall and the spring. But the River School of Government only takes enrollment in the fall. So if you want to think about coming to Florida and being a part of world changing, nation shaking uh, education, then you have to come for this fall. And then every mo every Monday through Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, my husband and I have a teach show. So some people have talk shows. We have a teach show. And it's called the Chris Ann Hall Daily Journal. And it runs from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And you can actually catch all our archives. Anna's pulling up there. If you scroll down, you can see all the archives of our shows there. And those are the archives of our articles there. Uh, but our purpose of the Chris Ann Hall Daily Journal is to bring the news to you Monday through Friday that you see every day in the news, but bring it to you from a constitutional and principled perspective. So what we do is we give you the operation of government compared to the only standard that matters, not Democrat, not Republican, but the Constitution itself. And just in full disclosure, so people don't go and get their feelings hurt watching the show, our motto is liberty over security, principle over party, and truth over personality. Yep, that's that's what we do. That's the YouTube channel. Amen. You know, speaking about the River School, by the way, I just want to say this. Every single politician who wants to run for office should be mandatory. If you want to run for public office, you better know the Constitution and you better know what you're going to be doing when you get in there. Because a lot of people are running for prestige because they want to be on CNN. They want to be, a, you know, all that jargon stuff. But um, oh, I'll cut that little bit out. But um, but amen, Chris Ann. It was so, wait, let me see. There's like a little, um, there's like an echo. I'll keep that part and I'll edit a little bit. <laughs> but thank you so much, Chris Ann, for, for coming and teaching us about the Constitution. I will have all of her links down below. Make sure you go follow her YouTube channel. Make sure you go check out her website. She has two websites, chrisannhall.com and also libertyfirstuniversity.com. Again, there are uh, lessons on the Constitution there. And if you know someone who wants to run for office or you know someone who wants to go to school and learn more about the Constitution, definitely definitely apply to the River School of Government. Like she said, there's nothing like it. I hear such good things about it. And Chris Ann, to me, you are very much a hero. I know people are humble and you're a humble woman, but I wanna say you really are a hero. Thank you for standing up for our constitution and not backing down with the accurate teaching of what is written in there. It is the most important document after the Bible. And there's not many people who took a stand and who are taking a stand now even for this important American Supreme Law of the Land document. So uh, you're just you're just so awesome. So thank you.